All right, I think we're going to cover all of that stuff. Uh, let us mix. We might not have in the presentation per se, but we're save some time for the end of it. Uh, we're a nice small group, so I really want to um, make sure the conversation is, is not just me monologue and, and all that stuff. So uh, are open at a couple of key points, kind of open up the group and see if there's people that want to share uh, their thoughts. Uh, I, for the background for myself, uh, we run Bricks Bounty Farm in Dartmouth, Mass. We're in a coastal location, so we're not in an extreme uh, heat environment, which allows us to do certain things a little bit different than other growers in the state or in the region. Um, we grow about seven acres of veg. should be a little bit less than that if we want to do it better. Um, we're a little unique in the sense that we do grow for a CSA, but that's not our primary market. Our primary market is a roadside stand that's open seven days a week, set up as an honor system stand. And... Um, give sense to people a scale. Like last year, we did, I think, about $175,000 of sales through the farm stand. So um, even though it's an honor system stand, it's a pretty legitimate money maker. It's how I um, you know, pay the mortgage in our house and feed the family. Um, I've done a lot of work over the years uh, looking at enterprise budgets, doing real detailed analysis of the economics of what we're doing. Um, and that sort of informs everything that I do on our farm. Uh, and the goal for today's uh, conversation, I, I, I spoke with Carol in the summer. I said, hey, let's do something this winter. Initially, I was kind of focusing in on, like, efficiencies. And we said, well, why don't we dial it in and talk about one crop in specific? And I sort of said, well, we grow an awful lot of head lettuce. Why don't we talk about that? Because it's something that I've found. Um, if you asked me 10 years ago when we started the farm, I'd say, yeah, head lettuce, you know, grow for the CSA, and it's kind of important. But what we've sort of discovered is... Um, especially for us because we're marketing right there on the farm, that head lettuce is an amazing niche because the stuff in the grocery store over the last decade plus has just like nosedived as the mescaline small scale lettuce mix has come up. I think the wholesale production of head lettuce is really kind of tanked to some degree. There's a lot less growers doing that even regionally uh, than there used to be a decade ago. And so what I've seen over the years is customers sort of, you know, having a huge kind of like, oh my gosh, like you, you can never get a head of lettuce like this anywhere else. Uh, same for farmers markets and things like that. And so there's a value there. And uh, I want to be really clear, like, you know, if you look at the mechanized systems that exist, uh, we're not com competitive with those mechanized systems, especially when it comes to, the, like, small leaf lettuce mixes. And so what I found over the years is this is something that we can be competitive because uh, we're eliminating the transportation costs that come with head lettuce, all the packing that goes into that. And um, because we're not transporting stuff, we can take something that looks really beautiful in the field uh, a magenta head here. This is a fall shot because it's got a nice leaf in there. Um, and do really minimal handling to it and give the customer a really nice crop. Uh, charge them a very reasonable price. We charge $4 a head right now for our heads. It's gone up over the years. Um, we're constantly trying to bring our prices up as we push towards this $15 an hour wage in Massachusetts. Um, you know, right now we're paying our, our experienced crew members around 15 bucks an hour, less experienced people coming in more at minimum wage. But, you know, we're trying to you know, both be paid from a, a farm owner perspective, but also make sure our employees are paid well. And um, we haven't played with this, but I sort of joked as like, Panisse is our most like sought after head of lettuce. And I'm like, I feel like we could just be like, we're going to sell Panisse at five bucks, put a sign here that says, this is like our five for 15 head of lettuce, which is to say that we're putting it at five bucks because we want to pay our people a better price. And I honestly think we'd be able to do that. Uh, I haven't started doing that partially because the honor system is such that we have a lot of signs up and we kind of feel like we can over-exhaust people's mental capacity to look at things. And uh, so we'll save that for some point in the future. But uh, for right now, we're charging four bucks a head. Uh, this layout, I got some pictures in here, talk a little bit about our operation. Uh, we're going to talk about fertility uh, pretty much from the outset because uh, that sort of underlies a lot what I think of that leads towards profitability. Uh, we'll talk about varieties, uh, give people a chance to chime in on that situation. Uh, and then just also talk about our systems in general and, and have a few photographs. Mike, if you could talk about plug production, of, of like romaine versus like a panisse, how long you keep it in the plug. I think yeah. that's one of the things we're trying to find, too, is like specific to different varieties, when you're in the plug too long and that actually retards yeah. to take off. Okay. Yeah, and, and absolutely, and we're talking about that when we get into the transplant system. So again, if, if people come in and there's other questions as they're saying, hey, are you going to make sure you get to this? We're at least in time at the end to make sure we, we cover that information. So um, anyways, this, you don't have to scramble to take notes. I'll post this on my website uh, tomorrow or Monday, so if you guys want to be able to take a look at this in the future, you can. Uh, it's very accessible. 
Uh, and some of these slides are from a presentation I gave a number of years ago with minor updates as I was putting things together yesterday. So headlamps is profitable. You know, if we're talking about a 200 uh, foot bed lengthwise, you got three rows in that bed on one foot spacing, that'd be 600 heads. If you had 500 marketable heads of those 600, at four bucks a piece, you'd be talk talking about $2,000 a bed. And you'd have 40 of those beds on an acre, so that's to get to this magical $80,000 an acre range. Um, How long in the bed? Uh, residency in the bed for anywhere between four to six weeks, depending on what your fertility and irrigation program is and the time of the year. So that's also a, you know, an important element that almost everything within lettuce head production, except for maybe a couple of rotations, can be easily double cropped throughout the growing season. So it works well on really small scale operations. Um, it works well on big scale operations. Most of the bigger growers, the, the difference is they're going to get to mechanical transplanting. Most of them are going to put it on plastic because it's going to save a lot of time to keep the heads really clean. Uh, some of them might be using some white plastic to kind of cool soil temperatures, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, this is key to me, and I, I want to make sure we circle back to this. Um, when we're doing our job, our pack out rate in our fields, and this is where we really start to kind of feel like we're we're making good money. Our pack out rate in our field can often be like 97, 98%. We're coming and we're, we're not going to leave hardly any heads that aren't giving us a $4 piece. And, you know, it's nice. We overproduce. We have kind of capacity to handle that. And, you know, it's profitable at this stage. Well, if you go even to 600, it's $2,400 a bed. And all of a sudden you're giving yourself, you know, another $16,000 an acre. You're almost up to $100,000 an acre range. So um, there's this capacity from a... Um, you know, Richard Griswold used to talk about your income is your profit minus your expenses. And um, one of the big ways you can increase that, increase that, your profit, excuse me, is your income minus your expenses is to make sure that your income is, is hidden there. Uh, we've raised the prices. So 2016 prices, we're at 3 bucks a head. We're at 4 bucks a head now. We raised up to $4 last year across the board, probably there two years ago on anything that was really nice. And I never have had a single concern with the prices at our farm stand. With our market in New Bedford, where you market to a lower income, we do get some people hemming and hawing. Um, and then I've also had people who said to me last year, they kind of overheard the conversation, not directed at me, but like, oh, these are expensive heads, but boy, they're worth every single penny. Um, partially because the keeping quality is so excellent, the amount of food that's in that head, the value is absolutely there. It's just, you know, might be like, oh, when I mean, they're used to thinking that, like, well, I just used to be 99 cents ahead in the grocery store. We've got two questions. Yep. Just, do you guys wholesale? We don't wholesale anything. Any suggestions? And if prices? I was going to wholesale prices, to me, it depends on the volume that you're working with and how important that customer base is. Yeah. If I was wholesaling these days, I'd say I'd put my prices at three bucks a head and expect them to kind of charge a similar retail price. But, you know, you're going to know your markets. Certain markets that's not going to work, and certain markets that is going to work. And also, I'm going to really emphasize it that $4 a head price. We're putting out a really good quality product. We're not putting something that's crummy. And it's partially because I don't go to the grocery stores that often, but when I do, I always look at the head lettuce because it kind of like helps your confidence. Because you, <laughs> no matter what like store I've been in in the last like five, six years, you look at the head lettuce, if they have organic lettuce, it's got a wire wrapper around it. It's been, you know, all the wrapper leaves have been pulled off. So it's down to like this like thing that's going to maybe feed somebody. And the heads that we're going to feed are going to be like, you know, salads for multiple people. So you're, you're never selling by the pound, you're always selling by the pound. Never selling by the pound, and it's just honor system roadside stands, so, you know, we want to th keep things really simple. Um, and why do we need to charge that much? Of course, there's huge labor involved in our operation. We're not, you know, giant mechanized system. we got bed prep, we have greenhouse prep seeding in the greenhouse. We do our transplanting by hand. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, typically for lettuce, there's two cultivations. The third is a bonus if we need it. Uh, we're talking about that when we talk about systems after we get through fertility. Uh, we may do some foliar feeding. That can play a role in terms of getting that pack out rate where we want it. And, of course, we have the harvest and the post-harvest pack and marketing. So, there's, you know, there's a lot of labor involved in producing this head of lettuce. And we want to make sure that we're, you know, getting paid handsomely for it. Um, all right, so these are just some general production tips. This will kind of put that over the whole conversation. So uh, for head lettuce, consistent transplant production is key. And for us, we found that producing transplants is relatively cheap. It's generally easier to produce a little bit of a surplus on the transplant side of the game so that we have consistent plugs when we need them and when we're on our transplanting uh, windows. We'll talk about that uh, a little bit as well. Um, variety selection. Um, varieties make a huge difference, especially when it comes to flavor, heat tolerance in the summer, downy mildew pressure in the fall. Uh, customer satisfaction. 
So we've almost gone away from growing any bib lettuce over the last three or four years as the panisse population. Like, we honestly could sell, like, 75% of our lettuce could just be panisse from a customer standpoint. They love it so darn much. And it provides that bib texture. So, you know, we, we can cut out a bib where you have a lot of bottom rot issues in the height of the summer or the fall, and we can still give people an experience. Um, we're talking about panisse endlessly about today because it seems like it's what everybody loves. Um, minimizing bolting and field losses. Right? We want to grow a crop that we're not going to have everything going by. Um, the key, that pack out rate, we kind of harvest what we can sell. Um, and then our planting plans for the CSA, we plant heads within synergy with our lettuce mix. So um, the CSA gets lettuce all the time throughout the height of the summer. And there might be a week out of there our lettuce mix is gapped. Normally sometime right around late August, or early uh, September, we had a transplant uh, crunch where we sort of didn't get plants in right on the rhythm. Uh, we don't need to use any irrigation in the fields, so sort of we go a little bit with the rhythms of the growing season. And we normally will plug in some lettuce mix or plug in some cabbage or something else to give somebody that salad green experience. Um, so it's not just a we're growing head lettuce, we're growing a huge diversity. Um, the key months for us, June, July, August, September, we do produce heads into October, sometimes pr produce smaller heads uh, into November and in the tunnels as well. Uh, generally... January, December, we're at this point of the year we're cutting leaf lettuce as opposed to heads in the tunnels. Uh, and in the springtime, uh, typically beginning June, maybe Memorial Day if we have a warm spring, but you know, normally not by May 15th. We're normally looking like May 20th, May 25th is when we're starting to cut marketable heads. Again, we're in a coastal location. If you're in a warmer location, you might be able to hit an earlier time, but uh, our air temperatures stay mighty cold. I'm not, I'm not uh, familiar with that. The Panisse? Yeah, we'll talk about it a, a little bit more in, in a detail in a second. Uh, Muir is one of these classic now summer crisp varieties. It's a variety that when I order seeds, I just ordered seeds this week, it's like one of the ones that I will spend whatever the price figure the seed company wants to put on it and make sure that we don't run out of it because it's become probably our most consistent heat-tolerant lettuce in a non-irrigated setting. Um, yeah, so if you're not going to protect your lettuce from deer or woodchucks, you might as well decide not to be a profitable farmer. And I can't stress that absolutely enough. Uh, you might have problems with rabbits, you might have problems with other things, but um, to me, deer and woodchucks are the best at eating a lettuce crop in a very short order. Especially the day before you should harvest. Yeah, I mean, woodchucks might prefer the, the, the transplants at a younger age, but deer are really nice at just coming and centering the plant. And uh, we're talking about that system. We use electric fences. Uh, they're solar operated. We don't use them as permanent fences. We put them up as we need to. And uh, we've had really good success with that, training our deer to respect the fences. Um, woodchucks... How, how high are those? Uh, you see a picture at the end. They're about five feet. They're not, like, uh, overly built. It's, everybody will develop a different type of deer pressure. Our deer have been trained. We also have a lot of forage with hay fields around us. So the deer aren't always going to come right to our stuff right from the get. Um, woodchucks, it, what we've done, we cr crop uh, stone-walled fields in New England, right? There's hedgerows everywhere, a.k.a. woodchuck habitat everywhere. Um, what I've done consistently over the years is we map out where our burrows are, um, so we have an idea. And that means if I have a new crew member, they can kind of have a, have a general idea, like, these are our burrows in this field. And we'll start trapping with, for woodchucks as soon as we see activity in the springtime, so as soon as they come out of hibernation. We have a field that we're not going in until till June, and I'll just get on my act and be like, oh, we're going to walk out there and start trapping woodchucks right from the get because I don't want to come in there and let us in June and have to deal with a woodchuck problem that I don't know about. Um, and our trapping systems is basically find the woodchuck traffic patterns and use a have a hard trap, stick the have a hard trap right in the traffic pattern. You don't need to bait it at all. You just kind of get in the spot where the woodchucks travel to and fro. Uh, if they have multiple entrances to their burrow, have multiple traps, we run about six or seven traps on our farm. So we can rotate them all around, uh, and then you catch woodchucks and you drown them and, and deal with them that way. Uh, I used to in New York smoke bomb. It's kind of labor intensive. Um, might be fun for certain people. I think what uh, have a hearts are pretty good. Scott. Yep. Just so you know, in the real field, you're not supposed to pass the law, you can't travel. You can't what? You can't travel the woodchucks, the squirrels, or whatever. All right. So um, we're gonna keep drowning our woodchucks. And squirrels until really somebody like, puts me in there in, in sort of in jail for it. Um, if you can come up with a better way to do it humanely, I, I've sort of I'm open to it. I've seen people kind of cover the half a heart trap, run a car with a hose and a carbon monoxide, just kind of they go to sleep. Okay. <laughs> so that might be a little like nicer because it 
I mean, the actual act of drowning a woodchuck is pretty violent if you've ever done it. Um, and uh, in some ways, I kind of, I don't necessarily uh, enjoy the violence, but I appreciate the fact that it is such a, like, like in-your-face experience because it does give you this awareness that you're ending death. Um, whatever you're going to do, you have to kill woodchucks. So legally, figure out the way. Uh, watch nobody's watching. Uh, just as long as nobody's <laughs> watching, exactly. Uh, yeah, anyways. <clears throat> These are some of the common challenges. Spring, I mean, there's hardly any common challenges for lettuce in the springtime. Your June is when you kind of set the tone for the whole growing season. Things often just grow like gangbusters. Summer, it's bolting. The fall, it's normally downy mildew. We occasionally have some aster yellows that get brought on by leaf hoppers. Um, protecting from frost is there. Um, so variety selection. We'll see some pictures here in, in the beginning. But as a general rule, we're planting uh, three or four varieties with each succession that we're putting out. Um, our suggestion rhythms, and you'll see this in a row, we go like 898, 1698, 898, 1698. So we kind of have this like pulsing rhythm. And what that allows us to do is kind of put out larger quantities. Uh, I like to do romaine trials, for example. Romaine is real popular with the New Bedford market, um, the urban area that likes, you know, wants a, a iceberg or a romaine head. So we like to bring some romaine in in July. So I, every year, will plant some romaine. And I like to trial some new varieties every year. So, you know, we might have a planting that we plant a little extra that, that succession so that if one of those trials just totally falls off the cliff, I'm not like, oh my God, that was a waste of my time and energy. Um, if you want, you know, when I farmed in New York and we sold uh, stuff down in New York City, they'd always talk about people wanted to buy food that they could talk about. It really, like, wasn't always about, like, the actual eating of food. It was like, you know, have a dinner table conversation. Um, and I think, honestly, June harvested lettuce heads, if you have the capacity where you're not trying to crunch a bunch of small heads into a box, you have food that people will talk about. Because when you have a two or three pound head of a uh, you know, like two star, or one of the nice Grand Rapids types, I mean, people you know, come across that at a grocery store. And then uh, from an eating quality perspective, what I find when you get to that is, um, for us, we don't really, uh, we're not trying to compete with real boutique-y uh, restaurant type crowds. Like, we're trying to sell food that's going to be like feeding people. And so a nice two-pound head of lettuce, it's like, that's sandwiches for the entire week. That's some salads on the side. You know, it's, it's a lot of food that goes out there. What would you there. consider the boutique kind of, like, what would that be? Salad Nova that's yeah. cut at a, you know, <laughs> young age, triple washed. <laughs> I mean, there's a market for that. Absolutely. It hasn't been where I can compete. So I've decided for a variety of reasons. I'll talk about our mixed <laughs> techniques. Um, I love Green Forest as romaine. If you want a really, really nice dark green romaine head that can have that oh wow factor if you want to put romaine on a grill Source. in the summertime. Uh, for Green Forest, we use Johnny's. I think Two Stars, maybe High Mowing carries that these days. Um, we normally, in the spring, we grow some bibs. Uh, used to be Sylvester, I think, where low is probably the bib that we've been growing the last few years. The spring is kind of nice because you can pretty much grow any lettuce you want. It's going to perform pretty well. You can grow back to like black seeded Simpson or one of these like classic varieties that gets gigantic and it you know wants to bolt in the height of the summer and it does just fine in a June harvest window. So in spring, you said the first harvest is like May. Earliest we've cut is like May twentieth, but normally by the first week of June we're cutting full size so heads. So when are you putting those transplants? In? Um, those transplants going in typically like the third week of April with some row cover. We'll talk about our timing in a little bit. Um, so the summertime. So this is key, right? You know, this idea of bolting lettuce is is. Uh, you know, this has been one of our competitive advantages is we're in a place where, for whatever reason, our neighboring farmers haven't figured out how to grow consistent head lettuce in August. So we can come to the table in August with, like, beautiful heads of lettuce, and customers are like, wow, this is great. Um, and so normally that means we focus on summer crisps. Uh, magenta and Muir and Nevada, but Magenta and Muir are probably their two standards. Um, before Panisse kind of, like, edged its way in, from a um, demand standpoint, we would often go, if we are just growing for the CSA, we'd plant just magenta and muir for like the mid-August harvest because they were so reliable. Um, over the time, I'll be with you in a second, uh, Starfighter is a green leaf. Johnny's has dropped it for something else. They still have raw seed available this year. Um, but a nice Grand Rapids type that can ha tolerate heat is really nice. So in your farm stand, have you got five or six different varieties? Yeah, in the height of the summer, we're probably, we're cut, you know, hundred some heads a day, and normally it's about four to five varieties. It just depends. It's not like a guarantee every day. Um, there's a few things, like Panisse, people honestly come and they're like, do you have Panisse? And like, no, and, and they sometimes would like literally leave if they don't have Panisse. Um, 
But for the most part, like, a lot of it's also the, the role of education. I could stop growing panisse and just start growing something else that was pretty darn good and probably still convince people that it's, like, great. It just, panisse, like, I don't know, people come here like, oh, my God, it's a work of art, it's so beautiful, it's, it's tasty. Like, we, I always joke when I'm teaching our crew about the farm stand, like, if somebody comes up to you and they come ask you about some petalas they don't know about, you can almost instantly guarantee they're asking about panisse and that's what they want. Um, Starfighters are really nice. Again, Johnny's is dropping it for a new variety, but we've been really happy with that for its heat tolerance. Um, new Red Fire is about the best we've found for the height of the summer for red leaf heat tolerance. Uh, if anybody else has a red leaf they like for July and August, um, all open to it. Um, we do grow Nevada. It's, it's not as consistent as um, Mimure. The thing about this is, is you're going to get to know your varieties. There's all going to be different growth rates. And so in the height of the summer, like our rotation... We might have, say, Magenta, Muir, Panisse, Starfighter. Well, in that role, you got Panisse and Starfighter that are going to finish ahead of Magenta and Muir. So with each planting date, you're not going to have a four-day harvest window. You're going to have, like, almost a two-week harvest window. So we often will be cutting out of, like, two successions at the same time. We might be cutting out of the fast-growing ones from the next succession and the slow-growing ones from there. And um, the, the, the thing that's worked for us over the time, and we're talking about this when we come to the harvest, is... We train one person or myself to be the lettuce head harvester. We don't try and get our whole crew up to speed. And we get that person to understand lettuce heads. They're not going to be as quick as I am, but they're going to understand the rhythms. They're going to understand which variety is going to bolt first. So they're going to be able to walk into a bed, survey the bed, and be like, you know what? Okay, we're going to save that variety for next week's CSA. I'm going to cut this for the farm stand today. That's going to be what I want to go to market with. They're going to be able to start making those decisions. And the only way we get there in year one or year two is by having... Not five or six people harvesting lettuce heads, but one person, one person only. The way I break them in is in June, I might have them only harvest one variety of lettuce for the first two or three weeks they're working with us. So they can really get to know it. Um, And we'll talk about that efficiency in a second. In the fall, for us, in that coastal environment, it's almost exclusively looking at downy mildew tolerance lettuces. Um, We have consistent downy mildew pressure normally starting in late September, early August. I mean, uh, early October. My fertility program... um, which focuses a lot on quality, has not solved downy mildew. The, the umacite product uh, fertility is, is not sort of disappearing. So um, for us, diversity is key in the fall. We like to have a couple of different varieties that we're working off of and then really kind of keeping an eye on things. Uh, Ruby Sky is probably the one difference. If you see like New Red Fire and the Red Leaf, we always put in Ruby Sky as a, a downy mildew tolerant red leaf in the fall. It doesn't have the heat tolerance that you have in the, in the summer, uh, but it's a really nice looking head. It's probably, I think, it's more attractive than You'll see some pictures of some of these. I don't have them all up there. Uh, so this is magenta from 2015. This is so. Then here's you know this was almost in the field for two months. Um, it was in this field for this long because I probably missed a transplant window and I had to push it, uh, which meant I needed to hold on to it a little bit more so I didn't gap myself. Uh, but magenta has a really nice bolt tolerance. Now, we don't irrigate. We're talking about that in a little bit. Um, it's not, I do not suggest not irrigating your lettuce. Most people are going to want to have a, an irrigated, watery, um, non-bitter flavored lettuce. Um, but our fertility program, even in the non-irrigated settings, we can often have a, a lettuce that tastes pretty darn good. Occasionally, we might hit a window where it's like, okay, this is a little bit bitter, and we might want to let people know they're going to have that experience. I uh, like to make sure the crew understands that I'll ha- I had a lettuce tasted right there in the morning, that's your peak of bitterness right there. So once you put it in a fridge for 24 hours, some of that bitterness starts to recede. Um, So a lot of times the eating quality for somebody might be a little bit different than what the tasting quality would be for a crew member in the field right there. Um, All right, so why are we talking about head lettuce? All right, this is a picture of our field last year in June. Uh, We got two beds of lettuces here. We have beets and fennel. We got some celery. We got Swiss chard. Under the row cover is probably kale. We have dandelion, parsley, we've got broccoli over here. These are melons. We're growing a zillion different crops. None of it is what you consider to be efficient because we're growing a zillion different crops. Um, What we found is that we can kind of find certain efficiencies. We can embrace that. And we can have the realization that, especially compared to something that's getting wholesaled and trapped and shipped from a long distance, we can put a product out there just a lot, lot higher. Um, we don't do direct seeded mescaline mix. We don't got these like 10 lines of, of lettuce that's cut at a, a baby young age. Uh, because I think to do that well, you need to have completely weed free fields. You need to have mechanized harvest systems, mechanized wash systems. And for our scale, those are three things that we've chosen not to invest in. 
Whereas the head lettuce doesn't require a great deal of mechanization to kind of gain uh, quality and efficiency. So, um, yeah. <clears throat> That's some of our uh, starfighters there in the middle of uh, summertime, 2007, uh, 2019, last summer. This is a picture. I threw this in there kind of to emphasize we're not wholesaling. So we can grow a gigantic head of lettuce and, you know, not worry about the fact that, oh, we got like nine heads of lettuce in a bin. Um, if you're wholesaling, you're going to want to pack things in, probably harvest things at a younger age. You might choose some varieties that give you a, a little bit more of a capacity. You can pack these in, but if you're wholesaling, going back to that conversation, um, you know, you, like, you want those big lettuce boxes, and you're going to have to think about, like, in New York, when we're harvesting and selling to the city, you know, the value per, value per box is really kind of a key ingredient of, like, what we're going to transport all the way into the city. So if you're in a limited space with your transportation costs, um, probably better to stay with lettuce mix, where you can pack a lot of money into a bushel and three-quarter bin. Uh, so this is one of our advantages, right? Harvested, put on the truck, goes to the wash station, goes to the uh, farm stand, and it can be gigantic. Now, I've got a, a lot of pictures here uh, to talk about some of these systems. But before we do, we're going to talk about fertility. Um, so here is the caveat, because it, it, you want to make sure that you understand where I come from. Uh, we till... A lot of talk about no-till and no-foot conversations. Uh, I'm excited to have people embrace that. We have not chosen to do that in any substantial way. Uh, we still use a rototiller. One of the reasons we like a rototiller is that for us, um, our July and August sales are sort of what drives our farm business. Uh, last year we did about $60,000 in sales just at the farm stand in August alone. So we need to be basically all hands on deck harvesting at that time of the year. And we don't have a lot of time to put into everything else in the operation. Uh, the tiller for my money is still a really quick, easy way for me to get from point A to point B. In this case, you have a, a section here. This could be cover crops. It could be a previous crop. And we can go in a month. Uh, we can mow it with a flail mower, put a tiller on it the day we mow it, and then walk back in three or four weeks, till one more time, and we're ready to plant. So there's not a lot of labor intensive. You know, for me, it's like less than an hour for uh, you know, 10 or 15 beds worth of prep. So at that time of the year... That fact that we've eliminated, uh, you know, multiple passes with the tractor makes a huge difference. Question? Which is soil texture plot? Um, oh, good question. Yeah, we farm a, um, a pretty light loam. It's got exchange capacities between 8 and 10. Very well drained, um, but we uh, often will rip down into the subsoil so we can get a nice root system. It's not straight sand. I would probably be using have to use some irrigation for straight sand. It doesn't also hold water like a lot of other things. It's a nice soil. It allows us, like, it can pour, like, two or three inches, and we can be on it at the end of the week. Um, anyways, we're not going to talk all about these decisions, but I just want to kind of put this out because um, I don't necessarily recommend not irrigating. We found a way to do it in our coastal location. Of all the crops that you might think about irrigating on your farm, to me, um, you want to look at the things that return the most money and where your pressure points are. If you have struggled getting, like, carrot germination... Probably irrigating your carrots is one of the best investments you can make on your farm. If you're a crop that makes a ton of money on peppers and eggplant and you want to push fruit production, probably putting some drip lines through underneath fabric or plastic is going to be a really good investment. If you want to make a lot of money growing head lettuce, probably one of the best places you can invest on your farm is irrigating your head lettuce. Do you have a regular rototiller or a power hour? No, he's a regular rototiller. Yeah, and it, you know, I'm not going to say that you're going to find like soil structure that you're going to dream about on our farm. Um, I, I, I think people are working with no-till probably have much nicer soil structure. But, you know, economically we grow really nice crops that taste good and, and, and make money for us. So for better or worse, um, I, yeah, we're, we're, t we're coming back to tilling at the end if we have time. So this is height of the summer uh, lettuce here, a bunch of muir heads that are going to finish. This is summer squash and zucchini, and this is we grow a teeny crop of sweet corn for our CSA. Um, nice picture from last year. Uh, when we talk about fertility, which we're going to talk about now, What's at the heart of it for me is, like, all our plants are solar arrays. They're dang, dang good at capturing sun and doing things with it. And so I take that humility and basically try to provide optimum conditions for those crops to do the best they can do. And for me, that starts with fertility. One of the reasons that we got away from using drip irrigation when we did is, I like, you know, I ran the numbers and I was like, oh, even if it costs five or ten bucks per bed to run drip uh, in terms of equipment every year. It's like, I can make that five or ten bucks investment in my soils every year with fertility inputs, and I can maybe go to a, a better place in a, in a shorter order. Um, so we're not talking just about quantity. Of course, big heads make things, but it, 
a lot of times when it, the customer, they're going to be talking about the flavor. They're going to be talking about, did this get put in the fridge and it lasted for two weeks? We have a lot of seniors that shop with us at the downtown New Bedford market. And, you know, they will buy a head from us. It, you know, it might not be good business practice, but, like, they won't buy a head from us every week. You know, if they're senior living by themselves and they buy one of our lettuce heads, they're going to eat off that lettuce head for two weeks. But they're also going to come back and be like, yeah, I still have a lettuce head. And I just finished it. I got it from, like, two weeks ago. And it's still in good condition. It's like, yeah, it's because it was harvested fresh, it was delivered, it was high quality, you know, so on and so forth. All right. Questions before we're, um, we're going to talk about fertility. We're going to focus on fertility. We're going to talk about fertility. Then we're going to cycle back to the systems that we have that kind of allow us to grow things efficiently. And then we're open up for questions. So before I jump into fertility, any immediate questions? Have you considered growing smaller heads for that senior market? Yeah, so um, my mom would always ask me about that. She doesn't live nearby, but she'd be like, oh, you're, you might hear about, couldn't you do like a senior share and you have smaller bunches and smaller size heads? you got to charge more, um, and I think you're okay with doing that. We have sometimes played around with growing mini heads um, because the transplant cost and the transplant production are all, generally It's all gonna, the same, yeah. It's all the same, but it's going to be more heads per bed, so you're going to have, so, um, you know, anytime you plant smaller, denser, you're going to have greater labor. And so I, for us, have decided that I don't need to do that because I feel like my customer base is willing to be flexible and also I'm just a stubborn farmer and I'm like, you know what? They really need a smaller head of lettuce. They can go to one of my neighbors or they can just buy our lettuce mix, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but like, for example, parsley, like you get a big bunch of parsley, a small bunch of parsley, the labor cost for bunching big and small bunches of parsley are pretty similar. And um, so some of those smaller things, they're per unit, they just need to charge more. If I was doing smaller heads of lettuce, mini heads, I'd probably be like, you know what, we're going to charge three bucks a head. We're going to put them on six inch spacing instead of foot spacing. We're going to a number, but the actual act of cutting that head and the actual act of scrubbing that stem is going to be the same no matter what size head that is. So you just want to kind of think about the, the labor cost there. That's a good question. Any other questions before we talk about fertility? All right, so these are the five things I wanted to stress when we talk about fertility. This idea of supercharging versus side dressing. Let's talk about starter fertility. Uh, we're save, save that until Skip comes back in the room. Vegetative versus reproductive growth. Talk about water use efficiency, and then talk about stress tolerance. So uh, probably a decade ago, I used to side dress my lettuce heads, kind of as a general rule, because it was like I was kind of in that conventional mindset that if your fertility disappears or you have something going on, it's kind of just nice to add a little boost to things. Uh, over the years, what we found is that from an efficiency standpoint, it's a lot better just to supercharge the bed, make sure you have your full season worth of nitrogen or whatever you need it to go right from the start. Um, so we have gone away from side dressing, and now I call it supercharging. And the lettuce beds for us are a great candidate. And what that means is we might put additional fertility on that lettuce bed than what you might think is quote-unquote necessary with the idea that we want the crop to grow really well, we want the... Uh, crop to be really high quality, and also because it's a short cycle crop, it's almost guaranteed that it's going to be planted something else in that real estate later in that growing season. So the economics of lettuce make it really easy to be like, pick your nitrogen source that's organic. You want a bunch of alfalfa meal. Alfalfa meal is an incredibly expensive source of nitrogen, right? If you're going to farm and just use alfalfa meal as your only nitrogen source, you'd be probably going bankrupt. But if you're not just relying upon your legume cover crops, you're going to probably be supplementing some sort of nitrogen, right? So on the organic side of things, you've got sodium nitrate is the most soluble, most water-available form of nitrogen. After that, you start getting into the organic forms of nitrogen, like alfalfa meal, peanut meal, feather meal. Feather meal is the slowest release. Go ahead and put in a larger-than-you-think necessary application and see what the results are. And um, I, I've talked about this a lot with, with people... One of the ways that we've learned on the farm is by doing trials. And we don't get over the, like, like we're going to trial everything in the whole world. But on a scale, whatever scale you have, say this is a planting, and you can break it up into two sections, and you can have the same varieties, like we can go Panisse, Muir, Magenta, here it is. And we can say this is A, and this is B. And what I would say is, if you haven't played around with what is my maximum fertility that gets me results in my lettuce crop, or any crop, and you don't want to do this on every crop in the season, you want to just pick one or two crops to learn from, is you say, I'm going to do something different with B, and see what my results are. Right? That might be, I'm going to do twice my nitrogen application. Maybe it's three times. 
and you're going to record that information in your whatever way system that you do it, and you're going to look at this when you come to harvest, and you're going to say, did it make a difference? Was that investment worth it? And you start to learn. So in the springtime, Skip was asking about spring fertility. One of my favorite things to do for this, and again, on a large farm, it might be hard to do it, but if you prepped bed A and you prepped bed B, prep B, and your question might be, is phosphorus limiting? And in section B, I'm going to do this, I'm going to split it in half, and it might be somebody with a bucket, even though you might be using tractors to spread your fertility, but for this tile, we're just going to spread it with a bucket. And here I'm going to put on 400 pounds of bone char, which is a OMRI a certified source of phosphorus, generally has an analysis around 16% phosphate. And here you're going to put down 800 pounds of bone char. This is a boatload of bone char. And here you're going to do your standard, whatever it is. And then you're going to watch. And you're going to learn. And you're going to say, what of these makes a difference? And you're going to keep in mind that if this is May 1st, or is this July 1st, you have completely different soils. It's the same spot on my farm, but their soils are completely different on May 1st and July 1st. The soil temperature is different, which means the biology of the soil is completely different. And most of where you get your organic release of phosphorus and all that good stuff, phosphorus is not mobile in soils, right? Your roots need to grow out to it. So if your crop is growing slowly, root system-wise, you're going to be phosphorus limited. That's a classic purpley to Nebraska transplant in the springtime. The goal with these kind of ideas is literally to find out where do the, the spot go where your yield kind of doesn't keep going up. If you're doing this like on an uh, organic uh, university trial, they'd actually do probably even like 1,600 pounds of bone char, something like through the roof, where they can see that basically, okay, we've hit that spot where it's not getting better. Does that make sense? What I'd be looking for if I'm looking in the springtime is I'd be looking at three days and seven days and I'd pull up root systems. And I'd look at the root systems and I'd say, well, is anything different happening in the root systems of this blip bed versus that bed? And with phosphorus, what I'd be looking for, I think we even have a picture. Let's hope we have a picture. What I'm looking for is dreadlocked roots. Phosphorus is one of the keys to sugar production in your leaves. And as long as the boron is there that can shuffle the sugar down into the root systems, what you should have happening really early in the game is you should see aggregation taking place on your root systems. If you pull up a transplant, this was the fall here, and I think I put this one on. So this is about a, 10 days after transplanting. But I put this on here because this was a field that we just took on this year. So this isn't like, um, oh, we've been like making this soil excellent for the last decade. This is a pretty much a brand new way. I think we actually cropped it last year, but it got short-sighted fertility-wise. So you can make these investments and, and have results year one. What you're looking for is you're looking in that phosphorus is dreadlock root systems. If you see naked root systems, you're not getting sugars to cycle down in the root system. You're not feeding the aggregation of the, all that biology. That's going to be a general good indication. Hopefully over time, what you're going to see is you might see other things that take place. You might see a different gloss to the leaf because you're getting those lipids in the, in the leaf layer. You might see a better pack out rate. You name it. But in the springtime, it could be nitrogen. It could be phosphorus. But generally, it's going to be one of those two to go into the spring conversation. And again, I don't stress doing these trials everywhere on your farm, but pick a couple crops. The one that was most successful for us in showing us a difference was we did a trial where we uh, took a bed of cabbage and we split it four ways and we put extra blood meal on at two different rates. This was like maybe like, this was probably like seven or eight years ago. And the blood meal we put on, um, I think we probably put it on at like a 200 pound per acre rate and a 100 pound per acre rate. Um, outside of sodium nitrate, blood meal is about your quickest available form of organic nitrogen. And you can just like, you know, if you want to get into some fancy like amino acid nitrogen, you can do it. Blood meal will take about two weeks to get released. So if you put it down in the spring, this was a cabbage crop, so it had some row cover on it. Uh, it's going to give you a quick boost. And that year that we trialed that, what we found was, literally when we started harvesting cabbage heads, this is where we started our harvest from. Because these heads were ready to finish about seven, maybe ten days earlier than the other one. 
And that told me, in that scenario, in the cold soil of the spring, that year on our farm, nitrogen was the limiting factor. Just putting that extra boost of nitrogen on. So, um, when it comes to spring lettuce production, and economics obviously have to be a part of this, but take one of these high test, quick release uh, phosphorus sources like bone char, is relatively quick release for organics, um, blood meal for nitrogen, and see if spiking the heck out of something makes a difference. Absolutely. Uh, you see that more so with nitrogen in the springtime. So this idea of spring transplant shock or whatever, almost always when I look at that and I would see that, I'd, if I saw like a yellowing of a transplant leaf, I pull a plant up and I see the roots starting to grow, what that to me is indicating is the nitrogen needs to be in every single cell in the plant. And if you don't have it in the soil and the plant can't get it from the soil, the plant will take it out of the leaves that you grew as a transplant and put it into the where it's needed for the growth of the root system. So oftentimes, with the additional forms of nitrogen in the springtime, we've kind of gotten rid of this whole idea of transplant shock. Now, I want to be clear. If you're just growing for a CSA, you're not trying to hit a market date, you're not trying to sell to a restaurant for a certain date, you don't need to be the first person to like, have things race. For us, say head lettuce, this isn't a picture of head lettuce, but say we want head lettuce Memorial Day weekend or June 1st, because I want people to be like, wow, look at these beautiful heads, and I want them to keep buying our heads for the next five months. I want to kind of make sure that we can really push things along and put in a little bit of supplemental nitrogen. So what we've done on our farm is um, it, it ranges every year, but generally like May 15, like anything that's gets planted before May 15 gets a slightly increased boost of both nitrogen and phosphorus in our fertility mix. And that can literally be, uh, you know, take the extra time to spread out some of bone char. And if you could afford it, blood meal, uh, sodium nitrate would be a cheaper form for organic farmers. Uh, I want to be also really clear, I'm not actually certified organic, and I don't follow organic principles to a T. We use a little bit of calcium nitrate on our farm, but calcium nitrate and sodium nitrate, they're not going to be perfectly interchangeable. They're going to have a similar uh, nitrogen capacity for your crop. All right. I think, I, think, I think that's a really important, for those spring lettuce farmers, I think that's a really important, for those spring lettuce farmers, I don't know what, uh, what soil texture you have, but if you're on anything heavy, that's colder in the spring, and not a lot of air, You've got to have an available source of nitrogen to get a job. Because it's just, I mean, like all the corn guys in Vermont, it's like we can learn anything from the corn guys in Vermont. It's that they know that if it's cold and wet, they are not going to get a job. And they got to get that nuts. And I mean, you're just like me. I, like, I used to, we're in Darwin, and I drive 25 minutes into like Dighton or Berkeley, which is just like over the interstate, and it'd be 25 degrees warmer and sunnier there. We'd have all these days in, in April and May where it'd be in the 50s and it'd be 70, just like a few miles inland. And so for us, that's like for us, we've decided we use a lot of road cover, which is labor intensive in the springtime. And I've just been like, all right, I'm just going to come to like love to live with road cover because it allows us, like last year we were selling celery on like June 15th. And I was like, all right. You can buy this uh, rare plastic stuff, 20 feet wide. It's got holes in it everywhere. Yeah. spring crop. All right. <clears throat> Starter fertility and strong root growth. Then we're talking about vegetative reproductive growth and we're going to end with water use efficiency. So um, here's the key thing though, right? Nature doesn't kind of like go to a buffet and eat one thing. From a fertility pers perspective, it eats all of the above. So a couple of caveats. If you're going to push nitrogen on your farm, I highly recommend that you gain some familiarity with molybdenum as a trace mineral. It's a trace mineral that's needed in incredibly small quality quantities, but it's needed for nitrate utilization. So there's an enzyme in your crop called the nitrate reductase enzyme, and anytime a nitrate comes into the crop, it needs to break apart. If it's in nitrate form going into the crop, it needs to break apart, it needs this enzyme to function. Generally speaking, molybdenum is a key to that enzyme. You can have vanadium in there, but most soils don't have a lot of vanadium. So, um, what that means in practice is if you've ever been an experience of aphid pressure in June, generally speaking, that's probably a nitrate flush. That might be just from the natural fact that your soils are warming up and the general energies of the soil are getting happy and they're pushing and they're all of a sudden creating a buffet of too much nitrogen going into that crop. And aphid pressure for me, I, some people might disagree, but to me, if you have aphid pressure, 
you have poor nitrate utilization, you often have lack of proteins in your crop, and you have way too much of this kind of basically the nitrates they if it's one and not proteins and amino acids. The molybdenum is not, I don't think, in the Logan test. Can you You have to ask it? for, yeah. So if you go through the BFA, which is the Binutrient Food Association, <coughs> or you talk to Logan and ask for their AEA test, it costs an extra five bucks. They'll give you cobalt, molybdenum, and uh, selenium. And if you're organic certified, you've got to show a deficiency on your soil. So if you want to look at that. Molybdenum is one of the rare uh, trace minerals that actually becomes more available as your pH comes up. So, you know, as you lime, your, your small amounts of molybdenum might be available. Small quantities. We're talking small quantities. Um, foliar application, soil application, two to three ounces per acre of sodium molybdate. It's a relatively expensive thing. Um, in, when I first started doing research on molybdenum like a decade ago, I was like, well, who's using it? There's a million pounds of it applied to acreage in the United States a year. It's used consistently within the legume production, soybean production, because that understanding its role in nitrate utilization, especially when it comes to the rhizobia bacteria, uh, it's well understood. So to me, if you're going to say, like, try and grow all your own fertility, if you're growing vetch, you're growing clover, you're growing other sorts of nitrogen, uh, to me, this would be one of these great experiences where you could be like, is molybdenum a limiting factor on my nitrogen? of my cover crop, and you can split a field in half, put uh, sodium molybdate on on half the field, and see if you get better nodulation. See, see what that looks like in a root system. So. What's your, just a quick, dirty backpack? How would you like, to Oh, yeah, how to do this in a backpack? What do you find, let's say, way to not overdo it, but get some on there? Yep. Um, I'd put half an ounce into a backpack of sodium molybdate. And it's probably basically like uh, in a four-gallon backpack. You're, you're gram it out. I, I bought a gram scale. This I don't ever use drugs, but these gram scales are widely available. <laughs> so I ordered one from Amazon at some point for the crew, and, and the crew is like, yeah, this works out well. I don't have to measure wheat, but we can measure uh, sodium live day. And uh, I'll put it on with some sort of carbon source. If I'm doing a foliar spray, a fulvic acid. If I'm doing a, solar, a soil spray, it's, an, it's a, a humic acid. Um, What's that, fulvic for what? Fulvic for foliar and humic for... The, hu the humic kind of holds things better. The fulvic makes things move. You don't really want to use fulvic on soils. But you're trying to marry it with a carbon because it's like boron and nitrogen. It can leach out of the soil. So it's one of the reasons why it's not necessarily readily available. So four gallons overall? Uh, you know, that, that, so if we're doing a foliar spray, yeah. that might be six beds. Over, say, if, a soil, soil spray, about a third of an acre we cover with four gallons you know, they always say like 20 gallons to an acre, sort of like if you're doing a boom spray or something like that might be good coverage. On a backpack standpoint, we'd cover a, a anchor with three backpacks. So we do get those aphids a little later on when the soil starts to come out, what's the best thing to do besides row cover? Oh, well, row cover doesn't help with aphids. In the greenhouses, in the wintertime, most people use ladybugs or beneficial insects. In the summertime, you know, you have to make those decisions. Um, uh, we think a foliar spray with sodium molybdate and some iron, which is one of the other key aspects, and then magnesium is sort of the uh, like antagonist for nitrogen in crops. So we think some Epsom salts, a little bit of iron sulfate, and sodium molybdate is a nice like anti-aphid uh, foliar spray. We'll circle back to this at the end if we have time, but I don't want to get bogged down too much. But the key there is, okay, if we're going to bump and we're going to push a nitrogen, don't do it in a vacuum. If you're going to bump and push certain things, you've got to be like a little bit tuned into the fact that some other things play, you know, play a role. So, but this is key for me. I am constantly digging plants up because I can learn a lot from our root systems. But you can only learn a lot from your root systems if you actually go and like spend time with them. So, as a general rule, um, I, I, I don't do field walks anymore. I'm busy, got lots of kids. I used to do field walks. Now, basically, what I do is like if I have an excuse to be somewhere near a random bed that we've transplanted, I'm just going to like take a, a meander over there like why the crew is doing some random task. I just go dig up a few plants real quick, take a look at what's happened to the root system. There's something happening that I, that I don't expect um, transplant-wise. Um, phosphorus, though, I think the easiest way to tell it is, is are you seeing naked roots or are you seeing good aggregation? All right. Who's had a lettuce plant bolt on them? Anybody? Um, all right, that's the challenge, right? Okay, so when we're talking about resistance and bolting, genetics play a huge role. And, you know, the seed companies are great because they've figured out what varieties are well-suited for handling that. Those summer crisps for the Batavian heads, they're slow-growing. 
it's one of the traits that helps them kind of inch through the season without just kind of going up to sea right away. Um, but what's informed us a lot when we talk about growing really nice heads of lettuce, not really nice stalks of lettuce flowers, is the work of Kerry Reams, and, and he did a lot of work looking at the vegetative versus the reproductive uh, energies within soils. And we won't go down the rabbit hole of everything that Kerry Reams talked about, but what we're stressed real quickly today is that he sort of placed the primary vegetative energy within the soils on calcium, and then he would say it's on calcium, and he'd kind of repeat that calcium for the next, like, ten minutes. And he would say, also, oh, yeah, potassium nitrate also. And so what that means in reality is that if you are uh, calcium adverse, maybe for whatever reason haven't been limeing, you get a soil test, you say, my pH is fine, I don't need to worry about calcium, so on and so forth. You're not having what Kerry Reams would say is one of the key sources of this vegetative energy. And when we want to keep things from that bolting, we want to kind of keep things in that vegetative realm. Um, the challenge that I see, one of the biggest challenges for organic production when it comes to good quality lettuce production, is that most organic forms of nitrogen are fairly reproductive. The ammonium forms that come a lot from the more complex forms of organic nitrogen, they create a reproductive energy within your crop. We use a lot of fish fertilizer on the farm because we're right out in New Bedford there. You know, it's five, five minutes to go to get down and get drums of fish. Uh, soybean meal, alfalfa meal, blood meal, uh, all that jazz. Those are all kind of reproductive forms of nitrogen. If you're using cover crops uh, for your nitrogen source, it's that biological activity that's going to start to release that. A lot of that doesn't go right into that nitrate form. Plants can take up nitrates, they can take up ammoniums, they can take up amino acids. Cariums would say that calcium steers your crop energy. It's what allows the plant to stay in that, re in that vegetative form. And if you don't have enough calcium energy in the root systems and the plant, you're never going to keep things from that bolting phase. So if you're inclined towards experimentation, you could run this experiment. And then you could decide and come back next year and be like, Derek's here full of shit, or he knows what he's talking about. Um, Manganese is one of the most, this black one doesn't work, manganese is one of the like, most reproductive micronutrients available. It's, it's known for all kinds of things, help things reproduce. Grow a crop of pak choy in the spring. Right? Is, is, there, is there any crop besides pak choy that's a little more prone to bolting? Don't even grow black summer, which is our preferred like, bolt-resistant pak choy, but grow like joy choy or one of the things that's prone to bolting. And then go put a manganese sulfate application rate of like 100 pounds to the acre, something ridiculous. And do no manganese here. You're probably going to end up with some iron chlorosis because the manganese is tie that up. But just go back and see what happens to your bok choy. A lot of times what plants are doing is they're exhibiting what they want to do, but it's partially based on what the buffet they have available to them from an energy standpoint. And so if you provide the plant with like a huge buffet of manganese, which is a very reproductive energy, you're going to have the plant have an easier time going towards that stage of things. Calcium is that thing that allows the vegetative to, like, growth to be there. So the manganese is going to push uh, regenerative Yeah, manganese is for flowers. Um, you know, if you ever have issue with reproductive production of your summer squash, zucchini, that kind of stuff. That's where manganese wants to go. Um, just full clarity, it's one of the reasons why, uh, so when I left the NOFA board, I said, well, I'm no longer, I, I've never been certified organic. Uh, I left the NOFA board, I don't know, five or six years ago, I think. Um, I was like, I want to be able to play with whatever I want to play with on my farm. We don't spray any um, pesticides on the farm. Uh, we haven't sprayed any pesticides uh, ever. <laughs> Although we might, if we decide to, um, and we don't use any like conventional herbicides, any of that kind of stuff. But I was really curious about this, and it's what um, made me sort of want to look at what the relationship is with calcium. Say, look at a calcium nitrate versus a sodium nitrate versus other forms of nitrogen. So what I would suggest, if you want to look at early season nitrogen sources for lettuce, you'd be better off playing around with sodium nitrate than you would with blood meal. Because that sodium nitrate is going to have that nitrate energy, which is more vegetative, whereas the blood meal is going to be a little bit more reproductive. 
This is just, just from a nitrogen standpoint. It's not from like a whole farm systems perspective. Um, <laughs> one of the conversations I want to have at some point down the road is looking at the footprint of various forms of nitrogen. I was like, you know what? They're mining sodium nitrate. Sodium nitrate comes from Chile. It's a byproduct of salt man, man, of, it's, it's byproduct of iodine mining. They're not really mining it for sodium nitrate anymore. It just happens to be that this happens when they do this, so they already got to use it and they sell it. Um, calcium nitrate, you buy calcium nitrate. It's not organic. Um, it comes from Norway, and it comes from the use of natural gas burnt onto limestone. I think from a footprint standpoint, Probably equally not good. Um, the key with a lot of these things is it's the small quantities that can act as levers, right? You know, if you're following organic certification, there's probably still a rule. Is that like 25% of your nitrogen can come from sodium nitrate? Is that generally the rule? Like, we're not talking about just putting on like tons of like sodium nitrate. It's a salt, right? You're like, your soil doesn't really want to have a ton of salt, no matter what salt it is. So it's just small quantities, but sometimes those small quantities can help the levers. What that looks like in reality for lettuce heads is we need to emphasize calcium to maintain vegetative growth. You could play a role here where you could do a trial and say, is calcium my limiting factor? I'm going to put some gypsum on at 500 or 1,000 pounds for the acre, and I might put a little bit of boron on to make sure that calcium works, and I'm going to see what the results are. You played around with different, different forms of... Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we we play around basically based on our needs. Our last year, we, last two years, we've put in on a lot of wellastonite, which is calcium silicate, because um, I decided I want to bring my silicone levels up a little bit more. Uh, we use a lot of gypsum for the soils that are high magnesium. Wellastonite. It's calcium silicate. It's a mine uh, calcium silicate from uh, New York State. And that gave you not only calcium but but silicon. Yeah, so for uh, for the cucur- it for the cucurbits, it's like a liming product. It's gonna take it's gonna take a while to, to, to do it. Joseph Heckman at Rutgers did that research a little over a decade ago with the powdery mildew to- uh, resistance silicas and soils. Um, you know, it comes down to dollar figures for a lot of things. The nice thing about dollar figures is like, come on, there's a lot of money in a field like this. So like with small veg, it's like really easy to spend money on fertility because especially as your labor costs keep like you know. Like, I don't want to reduce our labor costs. I want to keep paying our crew members more and more and more money. That's generally my approach. Um, I want to make sure we're not having them do stupid things and be a waste of time, but I want them to be paid well. And so, you know, the investment that we make in fertility is one way we do that. All right, uh, how do we handle uh, dry years? Well, this year wasn't a dry year. It was kind of nice. It was one of the first summers we had in a long time. It was really nice and wet. But this was 2016. This is probably our, our toughest dry summer that we had in southeastern Massachusetts. Uh, the old timers tell me it was like ever, but um, we, uh, this is a, a season where we had probably less than an inch of rain, maybe an inch and a half of rain between mid-May and, and early uh, August. So the soils were not starting at a place where they were wet. And what we did this year uh, when we planted is I, I tilled and, it, and then I uh, went through with a subsoiler and a mini chisel, basically nine inches deep, to try and bring some of that subsoil moisture up. And then I tilled one more time right before we planted. So I was trying to capture some of that subsoil moisture right before we transplanted. Uh, and then we transplanted. This was uh, lettuce heads here. This is why this picture exists. This is lettuce mix. It must have been harvested. These are beets, brassicas. Um, and these were transplanted probably uh, late July into a drought. And they had about an inch of rain over the total uh, 30 days. And we started harvesting heads right there in early September. And the way we were able to do this, um, and again, I want to stress, I'm not in Metro West where my high temperatures are consistently over 100 degrees, but maybe more consistently in the high 80s, low 90s. So we do have a a buffer being close to the coast, and we get a lot of moisture at night. Um, But one of the ways that we're able to do this is um, really focusing on potassium's role in water use efficiency and zinc. So, uh, and I don't have all the slides because I did a workshop on this a couple years ago. I don't know all the slides. Uh, but when I did the workshop, I was really surprised. I had no idea. Like, water is needed for photosynthesis. But how much of the water the crop is taking up is actually used for photosynthesis? Anybody have any ballpark idea? What percent? It's like generally 2 to 4%. So, yes, your crop needs water for photosynthesis. 
But it's not like, oh my god, we're water stressed, the plant can't photosynthesize. Most of the water is needed to exchange air at the, the uh, leaf and to bring in carbon dioxide, uh, carbon dioxide into the crop. <clears throat> and well understood, if you look in all the major literature, the role potassium plays in that role of water use efficiency. So in a, in a scenario where we're not going to run with um, irrigation for whatever reason because we're a little crazy, and you have a season like this where it just doesn't rain, boy, could you do this? Well, I don't think you can do this if you're not addressing potassium and zinc. Both play big, big roles in that. Soil testing, looking at my potassium issues, making sure I have good potassium levels. All of these fields as part of our fertility program have been getting 10 to 20 pounds of zinc sulfate per acre as a background investment in our fertility until we get up to like our target range of soil test. Again, the idea being that plants are really darn good at what they're doing, but they can only do it as well as you give them the opportunity to do that. I think one of the, the aspects, and again, we don't do no-till, but I think one of the aspects that no-till is, is kind of brought to the table from a quality perspective over the last five or ten years for the growers that are doing it, is like, it opens a whole other like, like toolbox from your root systems perspective, because all of a sudden you're getting plants to grow in a really nice environment, and all of a sudden small quantities of things that might be locked up in your soil can become wildly available. I think there's a question somewhere there. How do you put the zinc sulfate? Is that No, it's in a blended fertilizer. Yeah. So for Trell does custom blends. We do, we're kind of silly because I like to teach the crew how to mix things. So we often literally would just mix zinc sulfate in. Five gallon. Five gallon bucket and spread it. Not labor efficient. Um, but at the end of the day, somebody who works with me knows exactly like what it's like to work with zinc or copper and the quantities that we're working with. But for Trell, those custom blends, and I think for the larger growers, uh, I don't know if you guys use anybody to do custom blends in, at Holcomb, but uh, you know, working with a custom blend, figure out what your needs are, and, and that's probably going to be the most economical, time-saving way to do it. Lancaster Ag used to do that before they went out of business. How much copper are you putting in? 20 pounds? Five or ten pounds of copper to the acre. Copper plays a role in lignin. Uh, development, so when you get high nitrogen, if you have lodging and crops that don't want to stick up, say you want to grow like the world's largest sunflower and you want it to be just like, going to stay up there for 15 feet forever. If you have problems with things blowing over, that's a lignin issue. Copper plays a big role in that. Uh, copper plays a role in cracking of your fruit. So if you're prone to cracking in your tomatoes, it's a kind of a crop where you might want to play around with copper. We're not going to talk about copper in, in extension right now, but... All right. Uh, our core 15 crops on our farm are these crops. These are the crops that I've identified that if we do this really well, we make money, and our customers are really happy. Lettuce is right there in there. Um, so it's an important crop. Talk about varieties real quick again. Starfighter. Uh, Johnny's is shifting towards a new one, and we're after trial this year called Grazion. Um, but Starfighter has been our most reliable summer crisp. Uh, excuse me, uh, Grand Rapids, the green leaf Grand Rapids for the height of the summer. Um, Sparks is a romaine that we've had good luck with the last couple of years. Uh, that's a Johnny's variety. So this is, you know, we didn't have a really dry summer last year. We had some rainfall. Um, but this is a, a romaine crop there, August 11th. So this is kind of where I'm going. You see a picture with pack out rate. But we get to the point where we get really good yields because we're not having, like, crummy crop here and there. Just spacing. This is all of our head lettuces, three rows, spacing, foot apart. We use a Two Bad Cats dibbler to dibble the bed, and we hand transplant. We'll show that in a second. Maybe I don't know if I have a picture of that. Uh, Romaine in August is not always an easy thing, um, but, boy, the customers love it. What we do is we understand that Sparks is not going to be as bolt-resistant as Mu or Magenta, so we'll start harvesting that on the younger side so that we can get our pack out to be good before we do. Because, I mean, if you left those forever, you, you would see some bolting. Um, this is a, a good indication that it was the summertime because this is panisse, but it's not fully filled in yet. Um, those are the panisse heads. So um, we cultivate on our farm. We till. We do all these things that you know hurt the soil maybe. With lettuces, it's two cultivations. But this is kind of our standard. Like This should be about how clean a bed looks like. There's some uh, lamb's quarters and a few other random weeds in here. But uh, we're not having competition with our lettuce heads for weeds. Right? It's not going to be an issue. And a relatively easy crop to keep clean. Um, here's magenta, and here's what a head of uh, magenta looked like. So this is the key. When you start to get really good quality, and there was a little bit, you can see it even here, this, this row is a little bit shorter because we had it next to a taller basil crop, so it was shaded out a little bit. You can probably even catch some of the shade that's on that, the edge there. 
But when you get to good quality, consistent production, it makes the harvest a lot easier. Because you're not going and like picking a head, picking a head there. It's like, all right, we've got 12 heads of magenta to pick. We're just going right down the row, cutting every single one of them. Um, the quality makes a big difference for keeping it in somebody's fridge. Um, you can tell the quality is there when you get to a lettuce head. It has, um, like this is, a, this, we had this nice experience. I don't know if we see it here or not. But, like this, these guys here, this was supposed to be our cucumber bed. So we like, get it all in, because I was like, cucumbers and downy mildew suck in August. So like, okay, we're going to treat this bed extra nice. So I went here, and we actually did a double dose of calcium with that last night. And we did a double dose of uh, alfalfa meal. Because um, I was like, this is going to be cucumbers, and we want to like see if we can get September cucumbers. And then I was like, wait a minute, we're going to put cucumbers next to eggplant and peppers? That's a bad idea. It's going to be too crowded. So I was like, guess what? We're going to put lettuce into those. And the leaf quality that we got out of these guys, partially because of that extra round of fertility, is that, like it has that, like, you know, you can peel a layer of your spinach or your lettuce off, and you can see the under layers just kind of like all velvety and dark green. It has that like, nice waxy texture to it. You know, that's what we're getting when we're harvesting really nice quality heads. Put in alfalfa meal and lettuce? That was alfalfa meal on the last night. It probably had soft rock phosphate. Those were probably the three things that got supercharged because we were like, growing cucumbers in September is a pain. There's all these fixed costs on our farm, and labor is a huge cost. So when we're making investments in fertility, a lot of what we're trying to do when we're making investments in fertility is just to make sure that we're making all those other investments pay off. All right, we're going to talk about systems real quick. Uh, this is lettuce mix, raw seed versus pelleted seed for heads. Uh, we do our lettuce mix. We don't grow mesclun mix. We grow like a juvenile lettuce that we cut and we mix. We're talking about varieties at the end there for Jim. Um, Clearwater was a Bolsa Chica replacement. Uh, Bolsa Chica probably is high moines available still. Clearwater might have been what Johnny's put in there. I feel like the Bolsa Chica genetics, if you're familiar with that, it's a green oak leaf. It's got a really nice dark green color, thick leaf to it. Uh, I think it's got excellent quality to it for a lettuce mix, but I feel like at some point in the last five or six years, the genetics of it kind of tailed off. It, it was maybe a little less vigorous than it used to be. So we're trialing clear water last year. Um, this is how we do our lettuce mix, 128s, four seeds per cell. They're plugged out at six inch spacing and then grown for three or four weeks. And you'll see a picture in a second what it looks like when we're harvesting. It's not small lettuce. Um, for our lettuce heads, uh, we almost always use pelleted seed for any crop that we're going to be seeding between June 1st and the end of the summer. And the economics of pelleted seed, if you're doing magenta, I looked at it yesterday, it's almost twice as expensive if you're only ordering 1,000 seeds. If you're ordering 5,000 seeds, the price isn't that much different. Um, for us, it takes a crew member three minutes to do a raw flat of lettuce. It takes about a minute to do a pelleted seed. So it saves you two minutes. So if we were seeding 16 flats of lettuce, that's a half hour. So a half hour in June, to me, is gold. That's like more valuable than anything in the world. Because June, your to-do list is like this. It's like you got to plant your fall brassicas, you got to make sure your winter squash is in the ground, you got to harvest all these random crops that are labor intensive, you got to teach the crew how to do things. That half hour is more valuable than almost anything else you can, you know. So for me, the pellet of seed is worth it partially because of that time. It's also nice because then if you want to have the crew seed, seeding with pelleted seeds becomes a little bit like a, like a zombie type task. It's pretty easy. They can be listening to their music and happy and chatting away. They don't need to focus on it. And sometimes at the end of the day, in June or July, it's like, that's kind of what you want. We often seed in July and August, and almost all of our seeding gets done on one of two days, either a day where it's like 95 degrees out and it's miserable to do anything else, or I have the crew seed when, it's, um, when I'm at market. I go to market once a week because their efficiencies go down when I'm not doing things with them, and, but the crew can kind of keep on board with it when it comes to the greenhouse. <coughs> so run the, the dollar figures. Pellet of seed almost always is worth it uh, from a labor perspective. Um, propagation tips. Of course, lettuce goes dormant when it gets too hot. So you've got to do something to keep the soil temperature from getting too hot in the summertime. That is shade. In whatever way, shape, form you want to manufacture it on your farm. Shade cloth works great. We use shade cloth a lot. Uh, if you don't have rodent problems, sometimes just putting flats underneath tables. Whatever you want to do, you want to keep that surface temperature kind of below the spiked up summertime temperatures. And... Um, on a small scale, I used to just put them underneath a tree in the summertime outdoors. 
And you got to be a little bit careful managing if you get a summer downpour, but that generally works out pretty well. We have problems with birds because our we have a large farm and we feed birds a lot with all these weed seeds we produce and there's hedgerows everywhere. So we're actually at a point where we have to keep our prop house closed up because the birds will come in and start to like decimate seedlings. They love spinach and raw seed form. These are mostly sparrow types. And they love uh, the beets and chard and, then the, and, the, and the lettuce. And uh, honestly, like before I'd, I'd farmed for like 15 years before I moved to our new farm, never had a problem with birds in our prop space. Now I'm like, we've got to keep our freaking prop house like closed up. Like with, uh, uh, we have hardware cloth on the sides because when birds get in there, they, they just go to town. Um, what's that cultivation look like for us? Yeah. I mean that it can't be too darn hot. Yeah. And you will find out when it's too darn hot when you're like, I'm getting consistent production, all of a sudden things tank. For us, what that normally means is sometimes by as early as mid-May, we start getting some real high spikes. And I often will look at this. Um, you may not have the capacity to do this on your farm. You may or may not. But I look at the forecasts. And sometimes, we typically will see like twice a week in the farm. And if I know it's going to be like a little overcast or not quite as hot and it's in the springtime, I might be like, oh, let's seed our lettuce there. So at least those first couple days that we've seeded lettuce is in like a, a really hot environment. Um, I use some of that. But shade cloth works really well. Uh, the key with shade cloth, of course, is you got to move those things to light. you got to be on it. Don't just be like, oh, it's popped. Let's leave it under the shade. You're getting leggy seedlings. In terms of plug production, for most part, because we're hand transplanting, we can handle that slight variation in plug maturity. Um, but overall, there are some things that will be a little bit faster, a little bit slower. Like the summer crisps tend to plug out a little bit slower. Uh, in transplants, and so I mean, if I was using uh, mechanical transplanters, I would probably kind of get in the rhythm of having sort of like two blocks with each succession, like the fast and the slow block, so that you could you know be treating almost that succession in two separate ways. And your fast block might be for us like panis and starfighter things that plug up really quick, and your slow ones, yours are probably the slowest uh, uh, in terms of actually developing a really nice root system for us. So if you're trying to pull those for a water wheel or a carousel planter. We might have to push that five days. For us, when we're hand transplanting with lettuce heads, um, we can we can just be like, "All right, I got one person who I trust, and like I'm going to tell them, hey, you got some big lettuce here. It's a little bit more tender. Be a little more you know, like patient when you're pulling things out of the plugs." So you've got two weeks from the seed to. Uh, or, 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 or. <laughs> no, I know it's generally three to four weeks. We're going into uh, 98s. I think if I was going, uh, if I was doing uh, water wheels, I'd probably put everything in 128s just to kind of have them plug up a little bit, or even smaller cells than that. I mean, if I was doing water wheels, you could be doing like 200s if you wanted to. I don't know. Does anybody do 200s for? I to me, I wouldn't go. I, I need a little more The problem with 200s is you'd have to overproduce enough to be able to like miss some transplant windows because. The nice thing about a larger cell size is like you get a three-day rainstorm or something that just makes transplanting a pain in the ass, and you just you can sit on it for a little bit. Um, so you basically jump from 128 to 98 to Yeah, I mean, we, we normally do 98s for our head lettuce almost consistently because I like the flexibility 98s give us with the transplant window. Um, it's not I, a real estate issue. It's not a real, I don't know, I have a rule of thumb that says any farm will always have their greenhouse be too damn full, right? It's like anything else in your life, you're like, this is what I have, I'm just going to pack it full of whatever. Um, what I found personally is I think I like lettuce heads at 98 because it allows a little bit poorer management in the greenhouse. That better airflow you get from a 98 versus a 128 gives you a little bit more consistent in your greenhouse plugs. You know, if somebody doesn't, you know, move things right to the right spot. Again, we've got a house that we sometimes close up a little bit more. So we transplant and then we cultivate. And for us, this is uh, this was 2016, but I have similar dates. Generally, our first cultivation is one to two weeks after planting. we are come through with a scuffle hoe or a clinier hoe or something and hoe this and we are hit the wheel tracks. And then a second cultivation for us on lettuce heads almost always involves hand weeding. And it's just a good way to have people learn how to be on their hands and knees, I guess. Um, it's labor intensive. Takes us about a half hour to do a 200 plus square, a 200 bed uh, uh, lettuce, and that's like with motivation to move down a bed. Uh, but then, uh, when you're done, you got a really nice clean soil, 
And the nice thing about when you have a crop like this is uh, your double cropping becomes that much easier because you have a lot, you have hardly any crop residue. Occasionally we do a third cultivation if we need it. For some reason we need it to be like dead clean or if I know I'm going to have to extend the harvest window on that crop and I want to hold it in the field, I might hit a third cultivation. A lot of times what we're doing with third cultivation is I just run a cobra as a, uh, a shank down the bed just to aerate. Just somebody's basically at walking pace or a little faster than walking pace. You're basically just trying to pull little billows into the biology of that root system by putting a little oxygen there for it. Um, Here's an example. So this is uh, last summer. We had lettuce mix on six-inch spacing. We got lettuce heads, foot spacing. We got our cabbage here. This was all transplanted uh, June 5th. Um, this got transplanted about 10 days later. It got uh, cultivated again, and then it had a hand weeding session. And I don't know what the decision was. I probably didn't have the right crew to hand weed here and decided that we were going to do it, and then all of a sudden we had the right crew, and it was July 1st. I was on vacation. That's probably what happened. Um, in this case, they got three cultivations. They were kind of close together, those last two. But this one right here set the crop. That was our final cultivation. So with most lettuces, it's two or three cultivations. It's no more than an hour for a, a 200. This is the longest bed in the farm. It's like 265 feet. But uh, it takes us an hour over the course of three cultivations to cultivate that. And then those lettuce heads were harvested mid and early July. Yeah, we got a little bit of purslane on our farm. Um, it generally uh, not a problem in our lettuce crops. Shows up. We actually had better purslane year than we've had in a long time. Now that I think about it, um, but it typically shows up on the things that we walk away from. Purslane is really good at handling drought situations. So uh, you know, yes, like. It's basically, if there's real estate, like the cabbage is, is pretty darn clean because at this spacing, there's no real estate. Once we get our, our last cultivation, the, you know, those cabbage leaves are all touching everything. Uh, uh, 18 inch spacing in a row. Those rows are two feet apart. And then our walkway might be a little bit wider. But again, and you know, this is something that changed for me probably when I started my farm is we, we put fertility down and we get crops to grow fast and we get canopy coverage. So our weed pressure is, is high. Like the weed seed bank that we have on the farm is really high because we're horrible about like mowing things on time because we like harvest our lettuce and sometimes we don't go back and mow this on time and all of a sudden we get some random things that set seed. Um, but we get really consistently good coverage. All right, real quick, I want to talk about um, harvesting. So this is bushel and three-quarters crates. We get these from Nolds or Progressive Grower. That's what we use to harvest in our lettuce heads. You can pickle barrels, whatever your large container is that you use on the farm. The key for me is I literally, I do train one person a year on lettuce and pets. And because I want them to get so that they are in touch with their crop. And the way I describe that is I, I want you like to, when you, like here we got the truck, we come out, there's crates here. I want them to like almost be able to like before they even walk into the field to know what heads they're harvesting. And the way they do that on our farm is by doing it again and again and again and again and they get to know it. And what that looks like over time is they can really start to understand where things are going to bolt. So I don't have to do any micromanagement of the system and say, well, make sure you get this variety cut, because otherwise we're going to lose it. Like, over time, they understand what the succession of varieties are going to be picked. Are going to be picked. Um, I found, so we're far, harvesting seven days a week. The downside of our system is we're not doing like a three or four hundred member CSA. So the most lettuce we're ever harvesting is like a hundred heads. And that might be four or five varieties. So there's just not a lot of repetition. It takes a while to build up that skill set. Um, <coughs> And this is a picture of our lettuce mix. So there's a weed in there, right? There's some clean weeds every once in a while. Um, but this is an idea. I mean, that, that lettuce mix is being cut. There's no, like, soil that you're seeing. It's, it is, like, very, very mature. Um, this is post-rain. This is a picture where I cut it on Sunday morning. And I like this picture because on Sunday morning, I got all these things. Nobody was on the crew that day. It was just me. And I didn't want to wash lettuce mix, but we just had a rainstorm the night before. So I just cherry-picked the center line where there's no splash over because all that's there. And then I didn't have to do any washing in my lettuce mix that day because, you know, I've got other things to do, like harvest zucchini or a summer squash in the case, maybe. Um, so one of the keys for the crew over time is learning the varieties and learning where that cut spot is. And what I found over the years, I used to train everybody to do it, and I feel like it was like they never got really good at it. When they get really good at it, they eventually make single cuts where there's not a single peel. Like, after that cut, you don't have to do a single peel to a lower leaf. It's just that cut and into the bin. 
the quality consistency is there because they get to know where the bottom rod is in a crop or where that there sort of thing is. And so all of a sudden, your processing speeds picks up. Um, in reality, for me, it takes about a minute to fill a bin of lettuce. 10 to 15 heads of lettuce in a minute, right? Take you about three or four seconds to cut and put them into a bin. For the crew member, if I wanted to get them good, I expect them to do that in three minutes. Um, and those timing things for us are important because we're so inefficient on our farm that I need to kind of kind of put a little bit of a, a guide guideline in terms of how we do things. Efficiency is based on speed, and, and speed is partially based on repetition. It's also based on knowledge and understanding what you're doing and how you're doing it well. Um, that's nice. So I know um, with my lettuce heads how long it's going to take to harvest eight heads, eight bins of, of lettuce. And we're out in the field. Say, oh, we got eight bins of lettuce. Okay, well, it should take about, you know, if it was a crew member, I'd say it shouldn't take you more than 40 minutes to harvest that lettuce. You know, if it was me, I'd say it should take you about 15, 20 minutes, depending on how, how far into the bed you got to walk. Got a 260-foot bed, it slows you down a little bit more. What's the burlap if necessary at the bottom? Yeah, um, so the way we harvest is... We bring cold buckets of burlap on the back of our truck out to the fields. And as soon as we... Because we don't have any refrigeration that we use on the farm, so we're kind of maintaining... I want to make sure that things don't get warm. So we're sort of anal about this. Like, we're harvest, and we're taking things, and if this is a sunny morning, we're putting bins on the shade of the truck, on the, this outside of the edge of the truck, and we're putting some burlap on it right away. This happened to have been... This was June. must have been a day where either we didn't have a lot of burlap or it wasn't that hot. Um, you'll see a picture of that in a second. So, uh, yeah, this might have been that June day. Normally we have burlap everywhere, um, but, and so the burlap pictures of the wash station never looked this pretty. But I was like, that must have been a cool enough day that we didn't need to have burlap over. You can see some burlap over, um, I don't know what that might have been, like arugula or something like that. For lettuce, uh, for us, we use the Rubbermaid bins. Nothing super fancy here. Uh, it's a single bin into a bin, into there. We're scrubbing the stem ends with a bristle brush to make sure that they scar over. And then we're um, packing them into uh, boxes. So it just keeps the milk from becoming a mess on the, both the burlap and the other heads. So um, single single dunk. Single dunk, unless we have a major rainstorm. If we have a major rainstorm, we use these blue tubs to do a double dunk. And that's just like a food safety perspective, right? Um, primarily, we're doing this because um, when you get a canopy, I don't have these pictures of these roots, but you know. They're not a, the, when you make these cuts, the heads are pretty clean. There's not a ton of dirt if they're cut in the right distance, but they're milky and gnarly, and just by basically what we do is dunk those in and give them a quick scrub. That quick scrub kind of scars over that stem, and you don't get milk everywhere. Um, so, yeah, this is a picture of, this is probably post-wash, so you can see stuff that's got burlap on top of it. Uh, this is our roadside stand as it currently exists. It's a shed with a couple of tents next to it. Um, here's a dis display for our lettuce. Yep. In that stand um, or at market, how are you maintaining freshness? On the heads? Perfect. Lettuce heads don't go inside the stand. Lettuce heads live out here under the tent, and we have a cooler with wet burlap. And or, normally we don't actually keep the burlap in there. We just have a cooler of cold water, uh, igloo like type thing, and then we're rewet burlap once during the day if we need to. It all depends on the, the climate factors of the day. If it's a dry wind and it's hot, we might have to do it once or twice. What we've gone to over the years is we used to pack like 12 heads of in and put a piece of burlap on top of that. Now almost all our lettuce is packed where we do like say four heads, piece of burlap, four heads, piece of burlap, four heads, piece of burlap. What that allows us to do is that inner layers of burlap hold moisture during the day. We have to do a lot less re-wetting of burlap. So um, this is a, a picture of Panisse um, displayed. It's always kind of butt end up so it's easy for people to grab. Panisse is going into, you know, four of these heads fit into a yellow bin. you got a layer of burlap, another four layers, uh, layer of burlap. I took this picture, and I was looking at, looking at the pictures. It didn't turn this one. It's a little weird, but I think this was nice because I looked at the timestamp on this because I was like, this is a really interesting light for June. And I was like, must be, like, not in the middle of the day. So this was at 7.25 p.m. There was probably a piece of burlap that I took off of this to take this picture. But this is the, I mean, you can't really exactly tell, but this is the quality of the lettuce at 725 at night by doing this. This means that this burlap and underneath it is the lettuce that we sell on June 21st at 8 in the morning while we're off harvesting lettuce or doing something else on the farm. So um, it allows us to carry our lettuce through 
to that next morning, absolutely no problem. Right. Uh, well, in this case, our CSA is slightly different than our farm stand location, so we have to move the, the box uh, 50 feet. But in something. that box? In that box, yeah. Not, not touched again. So are you uh, then uh, pulling in compost and lettuce after how long? Uh, if we do our job right, no. There's, we, I don't think we. I think we composted like a dozen the heads of lettuce last year. Yeah, because we're coming to the farm stand. We'll be like, okay, what do we have left over from the night before yesterday? What do we need? Okay, we're gonna harvest that. Uh, so in the summertime, we're harvesting like maybe a hundred heads. Maybe we do 120. We feel like we need a lot for this day. Okay, yesterday was a little slower. Let's only harvest 80. We just kind of manage the rhythms like that. Have you ever cleaned the burlap? No, I haven't figured out a really good way to do it. The way we do it is we cycle. We have a ton of burlap on the farm. We spend a bunch of money on it every year. We use the organic stuff we get, I mean, the untreated stuff from Fedco, just because it's been what I've used, and it's, like, the right size, so I haven't been able to find, like, my other burlap. And the way we do it is that we, like, this is a CSA situation, is that, like, it'll get out of rotation for a few days and hang up. That's in best-case scenario. This summer, I don't know what it was. I mean, we just had a lot of burlap crops. Like, we had burlap that was just constantly being used. And at some point, food safety is probably going to be like, yo, what's going on with that system? We, uh, what I've done over the years is I basically buy a, a ton of burlap, and then I bring new burlap in, like, sometime in late July, early August, and I bring new burlap in again in September. And the, the, um, the burlap will age, and the lower-quality burlap will just become on the bottom, and the nicer-quality stuff, because aesthetically it looks prettier, will go on to the next la layers. Um, and then if there's ever anything that like makes us question something, like if something hung out in burlap and it got funky, we're like, let's go hang that up and let it hang out. And if it's really gnarly, it just goes in the trash. We're just like, all right, that was poor management. That'd be like, um, well, first time I ever had this happen this year. We were out in the farm stand, and there was a dead rodent, a mouse just like curled up on a flat. And it was just like, like August. I mean, honestly, at one point I was like, is one of our neighbors like trying to like, <laughs> and I was like, and, and one of our crew members had missed it because it was like right in the front of the flat. They, they like looked at it, but they didn't see it. And so I saw that and I was like, okay, I don't know how that rodent got there and decided to die, but there it was. And I was like, well, that burlap just goes in the trash. I mean, you make common sense decisions. So right. burlap you're getting from Fedco? Yeah, from Fedco. So this is at the farm stand. We're just about wrapped up. Uh, Starfighter on display here. Um, easy for people to grab. Burlap layers. You can see the celery. All that burlap layers just keeps things fresh during the market day. Um, we don't do a lot of like super fancy signage or anything like that at our farm at the market. Just kind of make things look good. Here's our picture of our crop protection. This is uh, uh, all we did last year for fencing for the deer, and that's what we do. Um, this is a special, unique situation where we literally only cover four beds. Most of the time, it's like a half acre block, but it just so happened that we had things that we didn't need to be covering. These were peppers, these were cucurbits, and so it just made sense functionally to throw uh, four beds. Those are fiberglass posts, six-foot posts, and uh, this is all from uh, Wellscroft up in New Hampshire. It's a nice solar charger, well-grounded, and uh, we have about three or four of these, and we're just moving around on the farm uh, during the course of the season. So uh, we do grow a little bit of some mini heads, but mostly just in the off-seasons. This is in a tunnel. This is Monte Carlo. It's a small mini romaine. Uh, it was not downy mildew resistant, so it looked pretty here. And about three weeks later, some of it was still in the field. The house didn't look so good. Um, I'm going to be around, so if people have additional questions, um, I wanted to, I think I covered the fertility, covered the stuff, to see if there's any last like thing that anybody feels is really important to ask in front of the whole audience. Feel pretty good about things. Your shade cloth, you're just using that for germination only, you're not really carrying shading at the growth season. Yeah, no. You get that high UV. No, it's just for popping the, you know, they're, they're there for three or four days in the, in the greenhouse. And we put just, we just put shade cloth over like a third of our greenhouse. We use that for, uh, for germinating lettuce, spinach, that kind of stuff. So why have you not put in a cooler? Because it sounds like you just don't use the cooler at all for anything. We just haven't made a lot of infrastructure investments. We don't own the land. But that's probably not a good reason as well. To be perfectly honest, I think there's less work involved. But I'm sure anybody who uses cooler will be like, you are freaking nuts. <laughs> no, I think you're on um, But, like, you know, when I was in New York, we had a nice walk-in, palletized, moving things around. Like, I think this is our farm. We're small scale. We put things on a truck. It comes to the wash station. 
This is a little bit of a messy situation here. It normally doesn't look anywhere near this messy because this is before we had our tents up for the season and any of our tables in place. Uh, normally, it's like the head lettuce goes right next to the wash tub that's going to be done. It's washed. It goes right back on the truck and goes under display. And so from a handling perspective, we are really minimizing how much we're touching things. I think it all goes back to your four bucks a head. And every time you move lettuce, whether it's in a, in a container or not, you're damaging... So, um, I think coolers are great. Um, if I had a cooler on our farm and we chose to use it, also just like from an investment of like electricity, all those kind of things, it's like whatever. Uh, we would use it for three things primarily. We'd use it for, oh, we've got a thunderstorm coming. Okay, this is going to save us washing rhythms tomorrow because I can go ha harvest all the heads I need for tomorrow and I have it in the cooler. I'm not going distance to market, so I don't need to pre-cool things at the market. You know, I'm only at the market for a few hours a day. Uh, and then the big thing we'd use cooler for is like bulk harvesting of things in the fall. Um, but for whatever reason, you know, we've just decided not to invest in that. And uh, at some point that'll change, but it's not on my, it's not currently on my to-do list. Um, I'd rather put up more field houses or I'd rather, I don't know. I, I don't know. We, we probably, we're undercapitalized as a farm. Uh, I don't think I make enough money. Like, we bought a tractor last year that we now get to make payments on for another like three or four years. Um, this is like what forty thousand bucks for a tractor. Um, yeah, I don't know. I got. I'd rather like. No good answer. So you don't grow the salad mix. You grow all. Oh yeah, we grow salad mix, but it's not like fancy salad mix. It's cut like this, mixed with like four or five varieties. This is not washed whatsoever. It's just mixed in one of those. Rubber made bins and thrown into bags, so it's not not like a, we're not we're selling people a, a four dollar bag of lettuce mix that's like a lot of lettuce and it's pretty mature, so it's not like this like fits on a fork kind of salad mix. And some one of my neighbors can do that and they do it well, triple wash and all that jazz. Is that when you had like I saw some the salad mix where you had multiple seeds for sale for sale? Yeah, yeah, okay. exactly. And then the spacing of that was three rows, six inch spacing, so we just double up on our our, our lettuce heads. So again, I'll be around if, if people want to chat. You're more than welcome to. Otherwise, uh, good luck with your lettuce growing this summer. Thanks, sir.